seashell and the rocks that are on this side of it. And in doing that, I'm also going to delineate a little bit more of reflective surfaces. Now, one of the things about drawing water as a cartoonist rather than as a painter, if I were doing this as a watercolorist or oil or acrylic paint, I would approach doing this water completely differently, but I'm not. I'm working with brush, pen, and ink, so I'm drawing this as a cartoonist. This means that there are abstract forms that over the years I've seen in other artists' work or that I've stumbled into my own that suggest to me water. And I'm going to use those things, and I can't necessarily give you a justification for them. And one of them are these kind of odd circular shapes, which suggest water patterns. Um, they work best if I were working on a slick paper surface. Uh, with a watercolor and tooth surface, I'm not getting quite the smooth um, edge of the form that I would prefer. But it sort of suggests something drifting on the surface or something reflecting on the surface. It doesn't matter what it really is because it really isn't anything. It's just marks on paper. And I'm trying to put them in such a way that everything now is creating a pattern just like this. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm now focusing on a strong horizontal because this, I don't want to create any strong verticals because then it's going to disrupt that being the center of attention, the creature's face. Okay. Does anyone have a G-nib I can use? Ah, uh, thank you. And is it broken in? Oh, it is. Perfect. Okay, this is uh, a G-nib pen tip beloved of CCSers here at the Center for Cartoon Studies. And the reason I like this pen point is, if you can see it closely, uh, it is a, a large uh, sort of crow quill uh, cartooning point. And as you'll see as I begin working with it, it's very flexible. It's not as flexible as a brush, but I've got a lot of play with the line. And I've got a lot of control over the line. Um, I'm not putting much weight on this one. If this were my G-nib, I would beat the tar out of it. But because it's Matt's G-nib, I'm going to treat it with tender little. <laughs> OK, what I'm doing now is I'm emphasizing uh, the curve of this creature's body. And I'm going to go in and add a little bit more line information to catch how that curve works but not too much because, again, I could really easily screw up with one or two pen lines that were out of place. That's just about right. Now, because this guy is just slithering out of the water, I also want to put what suggests some ripple effects. Now, if I were working with gray tones like a wash or with watercolor, I would do this by laying in a tone, and then putting some white there. But because I'm not doing that, because it's a line drawing at this point, I'm going to use the pen nib to suggest uh, some reflective light on the edge of the form. And you always got to have a little drip coming from your sea monster's mouth. I don't know why, but you have to. OK, and now working with uh, this G nib, I'm going to catch a little bit more facial detail. I want to suggest the scale patterns around the mouth without being too specific about it. The finest scales on any reptilian creature's face are around the eyes. Those are the finest scales. So it's important to suggest that kind of very small scale pattern. Again, I don't want to put too much detail, but because this creature's eye is the focus of this drawing, it's OK. And I use the G-nib just now to correct and make a bit more precise the roundness of the orb of the eye. It was a little rough just doing it with the brush. OK. 
Okay. And I'm using it now to catch the top of the scale patterns on the lower jaw. There's our lovely critter. Okay, now, uh, this is what I really needed the GNIM for. This is where I'm really going to hammer out the water stuff. And I, gotta, I have a lot of room for error here because water is a non-concrete fluid substance. So as long as I maintain not working with straight lines, there are no straight lines when you're working with water unless you're dealing with a horizon line. And I'm cheating. It's foggy right now. So I'm going to be working with laying some forms in with the pen to create the look of fog behind him so I don't have to deal with the horizon line of the lake. As soon as you nail down a horizon line on a lake, you've suddenly got a dead flat horizontal ruled straight line in your drawing and it can kill the feeling of a natural environment at that point. No lake edge, especially a lake the size of Lake Champlain or Lake Menfermagog, really has a horizon line because you can see the other shore, but I don't want to distract this drawing by trying to delineate another shoreline. So I'm going to fake it when I get to that point. Now, again, I'm starting to draw these kind of shapes that I can't really explain what they are, but they help it look like water. So I go with the flow. Now, as I'm having the, where the uh, body's coming out of the water, I'll do a little bit of bubbles. Those little incidental things that we would see if we saw this critter coming up. And I'm also using the pen now to kind of catch the edge of where the rocks and the, shore and the water meet, the shoreline, but not too much detail because, again, I, the more detail I place, the bigger opportunity for really screwing up. Is that working for you guys looking at it? Okay. And I'm not going to put any detail, any at all, on the portions of the serpent that are under the water because the more I can just suggest that form, your imagination fills in more detail. If I start going in there with a pen or a brush, I'm going to screw this drawing up. Part of what makes it work is that the only real visible detail is above the water line.